I'm up in the uh, wilderness area, Cascade Mountains, and let me let bring you up to date with what I have been up to. So this is a creek right here, which is fed by a, a lake further upstream. I'm trying to get to, and it's fairly thick, but it's it's not too difficult to penetrate and walk through this all. Um, I have noticed that over here the water is a little more stagnant and actually getting deeper, and it's uh, it's the creek the size of the creeks actually widening up. So. Um, in hopes that I'm going to get to the uh, to the lake soon, but uh, I've got my little my little buddy Harley with me, my little companion. Come on, boy. And uh, so, not quite alone. It's kind of nice to have the company of an animal, and uh, always good to get outside in such a beautiful summer. So when it comes to safe drinking water. There's two sources that I will never purify and I'm always happy to drink. And that's when I see it coming out of the ground and alpine water from snow melt. Um, at the high elevation, it tends to be very safe in my neck of the woods. So a little area, little streams and, and runoff from the snow melt is usually good to go. So right next to me here, you can see this hole in the ground and that's a natural spring right there and that water is as pure and perfect as it gets. Huh. Looks like I might have company in this area. One, two, three, four. See all the nails? That's bear right there. That's black bear. I'm not surprised that they would be in an area like this at all. Um, kind of one of the benefits of having the, the dog is because Harley would be able to smell the bear and at least alert me to it. So definitely a lot of movement of deer along the riverbank. I'm um, actually getting into what looks like a meadowy area. This is just so spectacular. I kind of scouted it out on a map. Um, topographical map before coming out. There's no trail to get here, so I had to bushwhack for about a mile off of a uh, uh, wilderness trail. And then, uh, sure enough, it seems to be panning out to what I was hoping for. But a couple lakes that way, and that's what I'm in search for. All right, I'm in bear country. So I showed you that track back there. Look up on this tree. Nail marks. They've been uh, scratching, scratching on this uh, pine right here. All right. So now that I know that there's presence of bears around here, which it's bear country, I um, uh, kind of figured they'd be around. I'm out here and very isolated. So we'll just try and be as smart as we can. There we go. Just talking about elk. There's fairly fresh elk tracks right there. This is false hellebore, a toxic plant that should never be consumed. You can, however, make a decoction out of this plant and apply it externally to relieve any muscular pain. Oh, look at this. All to myself. Well, maybe a few bears. Some elk and a few other animals, but the only human in the area, just me and Hardy. Let's hope there's fish in here. The water is crystal clear and beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. Okay, so I think I found a little spot where I'm going to make camp. This is the meadow area here in front of me, and um, so that's west and that's north. So the wind predominantly comes out of the west and it has been blowing lately in the evening so what i want to do is make sure that my shelter is side on to that wind give me a nice open view of the meadow um, and i'm really close to both lakes there's a whole bunch of dead trees up there as you can see and uh, i'm going to go see if i can harvest my materials from there i don't want to use anything live i want to only use dead stuff
Okay, let's head back to our little shelter area. I've got three pretty good logs here, which will form our uh, tripod, and then we'll get our top strung. Little bit of uh, paracord to tie the two pieces together to support my A-frame, and then the under end of the ridge pole is tied to the tree. It's not the prettiest materials I've ever seen, but I don't want to cut down anything live, so this will have to do. Well, I've got my camp all set up, as you can see there, my A-frame with the top, and then we have a nice little fire going here, and I'm um, just finished boiling some water, and look at the view that I get to stare at now. The sun is setting just behind the trees, it's about 8 o'clock. It is just that magical hour. So check it out. I'm stoked. I got breakfast. This little part of the creek over here. Yesterday, I walked um, down here and could have sworn I'd seen a fish move inside here. And I have not seen any fish around in either of these lakes um, or these creeks. So. Um, I decided just to leave some uh, bait on a hook here overnight and uh, looks like I hooked him. So I'm stoked. He's small, small trout, but that's okay. It's food. Yay! Look at this little guy. Beautiful. I mean, he's small. He's like, he's like the size of my hand, but I tell you what, beggars can't be choosers. This will be tasty. Yeah. Now the trick is to try and get a fire going. It is so, um, there's so much dew here this morning. Like everything is wet. So this is going to be a little tricky trying to find some dry stuff. But uh, we'll get it going one way or the other. See these uh, clumps of grass? So I opened up one yesterday and used it for my fire last night. It's some sort of like a rodent that lives inside these or makes them as like a nest. I noticed a bunch of droppings. But so the outside is fairly moist, but the inside I'm hoping is going to be dry enough for me to get a fire going. So I'll take some of this. See what we can do. So this time, I'm using an old school method. A piece of flint, chert, actually any rock that's um, on the hardness scale of seven or more, as I understand. But I mean, uh, you can use almost anything that's got a sharp edge. Um, I've used obsidian, I've used quartzite, which is very common. And then we've got our charred cloth. And... And then we have our sea steel. So you hit the edge of the rock with a glancing blow and it'll throw off these very, very small, low grade sparks. And hopefully those sparks will go into the char cloth. That char cloth, the nature of the char is it'll, um, it'll catch a really low grade spark and it'll continue to smolder until all of the, the material is burned through. So it makes unbelievable, um, unbelievable ember at a very high temperature um, for tinder so we'll give it a go see the red glow come on baby
yet. Going to have to nurse it a little bit. Come on, we're going to get this. Okay, <laughs> now we're in business. Man, that was a tricky one to get going. But it's always a good feeling when you do. Okay, awesome. Hey pipes, a little bit of fish for breakfast. Pine needle tea and some roasted trout for breakfast. Man, that makes a man feel good. Yeah, so flint and steel is, um, is an old method of starting fire. And all it really is is, um, is high carbon steel that they, that they kind of molded or cast into a, a C shape so that you protect your fingers when you're striking on the edge of something sharp. Traditionally, it was used with flint, but you know, as I said, there's many, many rocks that can be used. Um, now, these days, we have a ferro rod. Now, a ferro rod is an alloy of different pyphoric um, uh, mat materials, metals. So that would usually be very high magnesium, a bit of carbon, maybe some aluminum. And they throw a high grade spark, a spark that, as you know, would ignite a tinder bundle just, you know, just on its own. The thing with the, um, the flint and steel is that with that sea steel, that high carbon steel, you would get way more stripes during out of the lifetime of a sea steel than you would out of a ferro rod. However, it throws that low grade spark. So you do need to have charred material in order to capture that spark. Charred material, the nature of it is to, uh, is to char something, is to, is to basically burn it without the oxygen content. Um, and so it actually gets charred instead of burnt and it gives it these properties to where it's uh, really susceptible to um, taking a spark but it will uh, it won't actually burn up into flame but when it does uh, burn as an ember it's hot it burns real hot so um, I think that that's probably what got me through getting this tinder bundle ignited today was that the uh, that ember was really hot so I just choose to carry it uh, just to do try something different have fun with something different different skill set different challenge but um, would I carry that around with me over a ferro rod no because it's a little limiting and you do require a fire in order to char more material so i would pick a ferro rod however it's a pretty neat thing to play around with oh, ho, ho, ho. nice and crispy look at that Oh, I cannot tell you how much I hate going to bed with an empty stomach. Managed to get probably the only little fish in this area that I'm in right now. So I might be small, but this fish will get me through the day. So smoky, but this is what's keeping the mosquitoes away. Harley's stoked. He just got the head. I bring some food out for him, and on this trip I did bring, um, I brought some, a uh, couple sweet potatoes as kind of like a supplement, but um, yeah, I make sure I feed Harley, uh, you know, one meal a day, so he kind of goes on a little fast with me. A lot of these trips tend to be eating um, a lot less than you usually would, and I do believe it's healthy uh, to kind of fast and give your body a little bit of a cleanse so uh, you know typically there'll be one meal a day sometimes two and they'll be small but really really feel good about doing that every now and then to my body all right packed up and we're headed out got to try find somewhere that has less mosquitoes i know that might be futile but um got to try something this area is quite boggy and i'm just hoping <clears throat> that another area that we find with less bog um We'll have a little less mosquitoes, but it is driving me and Harley crazy. So Harley's ready to go, bags are packed, and uh, let's go.
to see what else we can find. Well, that's the sign that I want to see. Nice buck standing right there staring at me. I've been seeing a lot of sign. And part of the reason of coming up here was a scouting trip. There's a good one. Look at this guy. It's actually pretty long. It's a uh, banana slug. And this guy is actually edible. And they don't taste too bad, from what I'm told. <laughs> I haven't been in the situation where I've felt uh, the need to try it yet. Um, but I'm obviously not going to eat him now. Let him go. But I just wanted to show you that's pretty cool. Pretty amazing creatures. Alrighty, look at the spot that I am in and I am seeing fish hit the surface of the water so I'm pretty excited so I'm going to pull out the little telescopic rod let's throw a lure and let's see if we can put dinner on the table this is beautiful The brookie, he's a slimy bugger. Look at that beautiful little brook trout. Beautiful, look at him. I mean, he's small, but they are so tasty when they're small. Super stoked. No way. It's a salamander. Look at that. So I'm supposed to be able to dip this phone underwater. And uh, still under Apple Care, so why not? Let's give it a try. Uh, let's see. Yep, phone's still working. Good. Man, it's unbelievable what they do with phones these days. It's the quality of this footage is great. It's you can put it underwater and you can film salamanders. That's fantastic. I gotta try to get one with a fish. Oh yeah. Got another one. Oh this is a Oh no! Ah damn it, he got away. Ah, he was a big one too. That's alright, that's alright, we'll get more. Brookie. Much better size. Oh yeah. And there we go. A couple of brookies in a rainbow. Three perfect fish for dinner. Harley's even gonna get one tonight, that's for sure. So he's gonna eat well. So here's the new shelter setup. You'll see, uh, so yesterday I did the A-frame. This is kind of like an A-frame and a lean-to. See the door is nice and high and uh, all the other sides are enclosed. That's one of the benefits of having a hexagonal shaped tarp is you can do quite a few different configurations. Uh, this is my favorite way and all it takes is one pole that's uh, a little less than shoulder height. Okay, so check this out. I've got the three fish and you can see the flies have been buzzing around them. They're actually slightly dehydrated because I've hung them up in the sun. Now the issue is that when you have a lot of flies around, even if you do try and sun dry this, that right there is fly eggs. It doesn't take very long for them to come and lay eggs in the most moist part of your fish so yes drying out uh, meat can be a great way to preserve it but you cannot have flies if you have flies then it's gonna go putrid once those little eggs start to hatch and you get worms coming out of the meat so you would have to smoke the fish now 
for me, I'm not worried about either or because I'm going to be boiling the fish. Now, boiling or roasting the fish will kill um, will kill those eggs, especially when they've only you know it's only like three hours old. So just uh, something to keep in your back pocket that yes, drying meat is definitely a great way to store it, but you you can't have these little flies around. And up here in the mountains, man, between the mosquitoes and the and the flies, um, if you, you gotta have to make sure you cook everything really well um, or smoke it. So you know, you gotta get rid of the moisture in the meat. That's the trick. All right, so I'm carrying some snare wire with me here, and I'm not actually gonna use it to snare anything. Um, because when I got fish, I don't feel like snaring, <laughs> you know, rodents is necessary, um, squirrels, whatever it may be. So just something I wanted to show you with the snare wire is, um, I've heard people, a lot of people say before that um, if you're going to carry snare wire, you need to have a leatherman or some, you know, wire cutter or something to cut the wire. Well, that's not, that's not necessarily true. It depends on the gauge of the wire, but standard sort of around 20 gauge trapping wire um you actually can can do without a leatherman let me show you the trick okay so i've got a decent sized rock here with um a fairly sharp edge on on that side you need a little bit of weight to the rock put your um wire on a high point kind of line it up and that actually just broke that in half straight away but usually it gives a little bit of a a divot in here and then you can just twist it and it breaks within a couple turns so that's just a little hack if you have snare wire and no way to cut it into shorter lengths so seeing as though i'm so full of little bushcraft hacks today let me show you another one first off oh look at that beautiful fish soup boiling up that is amazing and then got some sweet potatoes boiling in there survival what nah we're camping. Here's my little trick. That right there is a clean canteen bottle. Pretty standard in the, I guess, survival bushcraft world. Stainless steel bottle, um, big wide mouth. And once you have brought your water to a boil in there, I've had a lot of people not sure on how to remove it. Well, you could make a pair of tongs. That's often what I do too. You could do that out of wood. You could gently screw the lid on a couple turns and then pull it out. If you have a carabiner handy, you could take a carabiner and it's the perfect little device to remove your bottle without spilling. So as you can see, I am tying a fishing net. Yep, I got a little uh, ants in my pants today and just wanted to make a little net to keep up the skill. I actually haven't tied a complete net from start to finish. When I was on uh, alone, I took a gill net and things that you didn't see on there is that the, uh, some of the, the large lake trout that I got in the net ended up ripping the net up so many times. It got to the point where every single time I retrieved my net, I had to make considerable repairs. And the benefit is that <clears throat> my um, gill net was monofilament and I took as one of my items monofilament fishing line so I used a lot of my fishing line to repair my gill net and that was my strategy but I didn't realize just how damaged it would get so from doing all those repairs I effectively just remade a net um, and that was the only time that I'd ever um, worked with a gill net repaired a gill net and made a gill net you know if you even want to call it that um man but what an item i'm so grateful i took it and i learned so much um i just have never out of all the fishing methods i've done never ever have i used a gill net and that's primarily because it's illegal so in so many places so um so you know i kind of got this had this thing in my head like well i haven't actually made one from scratch and so I decided that uh, I'd just make a, a small one, you know, four feet or so, four feet by about two or three feet. And just, um, I mean, whether it's four feet by two or 20 by eight, doesn't really matter. It's all the same principle. We were lucky on a loan because we were on Native American lands up there and they are allowed to use them. And so we were effectively allowed to abide by the same rules they abide by. 
Um, and so we very fortunate, but um, in a survival situation, I've learned that this would be, I mean, this is, this ticks all the boxes. It, uh, it's passive. You just make it once and it takes no calories to make. It just sits here and, and, you know, uh, tie a bunch of knots and then we get it set in the water and let it do its thing. You just got to put it in the right location. It, that's the key. But if you can, it's making catching food for you while you're doing other things i mean it is absolutely um a perfect uh, uh food procuring tool for sure so. okay so here's the real basics to tying your own gill net with paracord and i learned this from my buddy keith so you'll take your piece of paracord or in one of the inner strands um, and then you, have, you, of course, have the outer sheathing right here, which is going to be your main support. So this is your top line. And then you're going to use this to make um, all of your meshes. So double this one up, fold it over, and then wrap these two back through it. And you will then have an overhand knot like that. Do the same thing over and over again. And of course, the spacing depends on the mesh sizes. So the mesh size depends on the type of, on the size of the fish you're catching. So you always want to have a look or try or try to try to observe the the size of the of the fish that you're targeting, because if you're going for a you know like a let's say a, a one foot size trout, a one foot size trout is going to have a head size that's going to be uh, somewhere around there. So you want that mesh to be small enough to be able to capture his head and his gills lock in, um, but you don't want him to slip through it, and you don't want it to be too small to where you can't actually get his gills in. So, you know, if we were going for a, a one foot trout, I would say mesh size somewhere about an, sort of an inch and a quarter would be a, a rough guess. Um, remember, you can catch fish big fish in a small net but you cannot catch small fish in a big net so rather um, just go on the side of smaller rather than larger so once you've got your your all of your pieces laid out for whatever length your net's going to be um, you'll then simply take two of these right here to start forming your meshes which are the basically your diamond shaped um, meshes on the uh, on the net just good old-fashioned double overhand or granny knot whatever you want to call it but it's the simplest knot you can get and the thing that really does not make it ideal with paracord is that it's waxed it's waxed these inner nylon strands are waxed and they slip pretty easily so usually what i'll do is um i'll actually add in another locking turn on this like so on each one just to make sure it doesn't slip there we go when you pull it tight like that cinches in so there's your one of course you have another one you do the same thing all along the length of your net and then once you've got all of those well then you'll start tying your second knots down next level and you just keep going all the way down um, until you get to the bottom of the net it is a time consuming tedious process but if you're the kind of person that doesn't mind watching paint dry you'll love this it is hugely satisf satisfying when you've got it done but it takes a lot of time this is the real easy way to uh, to tie a net um, it's not going to be the most prettiest and most perfect it doesn't need to be perfect trust me it does not need to be perfect okay so there is the finished gill net as you can see not perfect size meshes some of them are a little different to the others but when you're doing it all freehand um, like this it's going to be hard to get it absolutely perfect but it will catch fish 
So paracord um, sheathing on the outside and then all of the inner strands making up your actual net. Poor Harley's getting eaten alive by all these mosquitoes. So am I. So I think I'm gonna call it a day. It only gets dark here at, at like 10 o'clock and it's a full moon, so it's a very bright night. But I am pumped and I'm ready to go to sleep. So myself and Harley are about to begin the, um, the hike back to civilization although we're it's going to um it's going to take us most of the day we're going to go s stop by two more lakes um, on the way back and check them out as always thanks for watching and please subscribe